Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next session of WolfCon. Um, so we're happy to have a session today on linked open data, and um, the session is being recorded. There is a transcript feature below that you can click on show transcripts to have captioning. Um, please use the Q&A feature for questions and um, hashtag us at WolfCon21 uh, in your social media. So with that, I will pass it over uh, to our panelists today. So thank you. Hello, I'm Laura Mandel, and I'm just going to introduce everybody very quickly because we don't have that much time. So uh, Susan Brown is Canadian Research Chair in Collaborative Digital Scholarship at the University of Guelph and Director of the Linked Infrastructure for Networked Cultural Scholarship or the LINX Project. Susan. Hi, everybody. Um, just wave if you can't hear me. I'll open up the chat too so that I see if... You if you could just turn up a little. Right. Um, <clears throat> I'll stand up and get closer to my mic. How's that? All oh, right. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from Guelph, which is on the ancestral lands of the Atawandra and the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples and the treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, Indigenous and Métis people have inhabited and stewarded the lands on which I live and work for centuries and do so today uh, underneath the covenant of the dish with one spoon wampum. And I'm here to talk about uh, a an infrastructure project that I direct called the Links Project, as Laura says. So I'm going to present some slides and try and keep myself to 10 minutes. And I can no longer see the chat, so uh, somebody will have to wave if I go over time or speak up. Okay, uh, so Links is going to uh, convert a bunch of data into um, machine readable, web based data, uh, and with a a view to making the heterogeneity of culture and uh, the diversity and differences embedded in culture uh, accessible and uh, readable on the web in new ways. And it's gonna do this through linked open data. I assume most people have a kind of passing uh, familiarity with linked open data, but I will just here mention that it is uh, based on W3C standards for uh, data format and exchange. It's highly structured data formalized through ontologies. It uses standard vocabularies in order to ensure interoperability. And key to it is making uh, the sort of normal strings that constitute data on the web and particularly URLs into things and building meaningful uh, relationships between those things using the ontologies. And um, in so doing, the promise of linked open data is that we all get data that is much more interoperable, much more useful, easier to find, easier to share, easier to build on, and that we can reproduce some of the kind of serendipitous relationships to information that um, we've lost in the shift from um, physical to, to digital libraries. And I wanna thank Gloria Gonzalez for this wonderful metaphor of linked open data as being like a credit card. You can read the front, you can read the numbers, but it has encoded into it the means for machines to read it as well. So Lynx is um, called a cyber infrastructure project founded, funded by the Canada Foundation for Innovation, which, and it's only three years, it's basically meant to roll out infrastructure in the form of mobilizing data. That's the focus of the funding um, uh, stream that we have um, been uh, funded by. It involves lots of researchers and institutions from across, country, uh, across the country in Canada and um, other partners as well in the um, larger Canadian information ecosystem. So in a nutshell, what Lynx is gonna do is take source data sets. It's gonna convert them using machines at first um, through a range of methods. And depending on the nature of the data set, how large it is and what kind of resources the researchers involved with that data set will have, uh, it will have varying levels of cleanup and um, validation before it gets put into our triple store. So some of it will not get fully um, processed by human beings and others of it, other, other data sets will. Um, so we're setting up a big storage facility uh, and it will serve this linked data through a Sparkle endpoint and through interfaces that will both allow for the consumption of that data, but also allow for the continued conversion of data from other formats into linked open data so that it can be a dynamic living representation of knowledge about culture 
um, as produced by Canadian scholars, but linked out into the rest of the global graph and interlinked with other cultural resources. And all of the um, software that we are either extending or uh, building from scratch, and we're usually using existing libraries and so on when we are building from scratch, it's all open source. So this data will be um, open and so will the um, infrastructure that we're creating in order to make it and to make it available. So all of this is really about um, trying to think about how scholarly data interacts with other data. And so what I have here is a sketch of um, what I see as an ecosystem for linked open data where we have complementary materials uh, in these three large um, groups of stakeholders, the GLAM community, uh, the scholarly community, and scholarly publishing. And of course, there's a lot of overlap and um, interconnection between those, both in terms of the people's, um, people who are involved, the activities that they are engaged in, and the kinds of materials that they produce. So the arrows between the similarly colored boxes are meant to show the kind of continuity of the types of materials that we are dealing with, and that within our different contexts, we are trying to mobilize um, as, as knowledge uh, and um, the extent to which we are uh, really engaged, engaged in a very complementary and shared enterprise, and also in need of similar infrastructure. Uh, so the cloud at the top is not the linked data cloud per se, but the infrastructure cloud that needs to be there in order to um, create the linked data crowd. We need a lot of, it's, it's a heavy stack, the, the linked data stack. We need a lot of technologies both to create the data and to use the data. And um, we have similar needs across these stakeholder groups for um, infrastructure. And so what links, links is a short lived project, we'll hope to sustain it, but we'll only be able to sustain it if we produce something that is useful enough to merit um, sustaining and um, contribute not only to the mobilization of scholarly data, but we hope also to um, data in these other contexts. So what does that have to do with libraries? Well, in fact, libraries are um, our, our key partners in this enterprise. We have. Um, a number of really important library partners, including the University of Victoria, and you're going to hear from Dean Seaman um, from UVic in a moment, but our storage facility for links will be based at um, UVic and uh, Lisa Goddard, the digital scholarship librarian uh, there is um, one, of our, one of our leading um, partners in this enterprise. So um, I want to dig now into the uh, a little bit more fully into the relationship between libraries in particular and um, the kinds of materials that they hold and how they're treated as knowledge and um, what we're doing in terms of scholarly knowledge when we're creating linked data. So um, in this case, what I'm representing is actually a kind of contrast or complementarity between these, I'm arguing that they have a symbiotic relationship between each other. We've, we are all familiar with the metaphor of the library as the lab of the humanities. And I think this is particularly the case when it comes to um, thinking about uh, technological humanities and, and the production of, of uh, scholarship in the form of linked open data. So, um, you know, libraries offer stewardship, they have, they, they produce persistent URLs for things, they have stable vocabularies, they have this institutional persistence and organizational knowledge and continuity that um, we don't tend to have in a scholarly context where we're much more, we're, we're creating the knowledge and we're, we're much more engaged in sort of ever changing dialogue and reframing materials and rethinking things. And so these are very complementary activities. Um, and I look forward in the discussion to what do you think I'm completely misrepresenting what libraries do. This is obviously an external perspective, but it's also based on reading a lot about the future of the library and the digital library. Um, and so, uh, you know, metadata in libraries tends to have to focus on the, the collection or the, or the object in terms of description, whereas scholars are engaging with the content and complementing that kind of metadata with descriptions of the things um, and contextualization and interpretation of them in ways that can really help with findability um, in terms of what other scholars or other um, users of those materials might want to see. So we have libraries doing you know, very large scale aggregate work 
um, and scholars doing uh, work at the level of you know, specificity and granularity. But these things really, when you put them together, create a very powerful combination that means that we can collectively shift from a kind of classificatory or knowledge organization paradigm to a knowledge representation paradigm, which has semantics built into it. And then the, the, if we work together, especially if we can sort of work to figure out how to do this in ways that the linked data that we're creating really will work well um, uh, together, then you'll get a much better um, quality of linked open data being pushed up into the global graph. So, um, ecosystems have within them what are called ecotones, which are where, you know, two ecosystems uh, sort of butt up against each other and you get this sort of transitional area where the overlap occurs and things are less predictable and that's where change and innovation and uh, creativity and new um, organisms and so on happen. Uh, so that ecotone in terms of the, the overlap between um, the kinds of data that library and archives are producing, the scholarly data that uh, groups like links are producing and the overlap in the materials that we all care about and want to talk about and want to see um, made more accessible and um, contextualized, uh, framed in ways that take into account the bias, the, the need for decolonization and so on that I think um, is recognized in both fields, uh, the, the better off we will be if we can uh, collaborate. So what I'm arguing is that there's a kind of opportunity at this moment as the library world has really embraced linked open data and as uh, scholars in the humanities and social sciences are now coming to do the same to really think about how can we make this data usable? How can we make it serve um, recognitions of, of diversity and difference and, and expansion and improvement of the kind of data that we are sharing with the world through the linked data cloud? So that's um, everything that I wanted to say in the time that I had. So I will stop sharing my screen and turn it back to Laura. Thanks so much. Laura, you are muted. There will be time at the end for questions, I apologize. Let me um, introduce now Dean Seaman. He's um, head of uh, metadata at the University of Victoria Libraries. All right, uh, thanks. I'm just gonna share my screen as well. Get that going. All right, can everyone see that? It's okay, great. Uh, all right, uh, yeah, thanks. And, uh, and it's great to be here uh, with you all to talk about uh, linked open data and open source. And I'm gonna be talking specifically about a uh, very specific use case, uh, uh, the use of Sam Vera here at UVic for our digital collections. Um, and so that's kind of, kind of what I'm mostly gonna talk about, but just also have some general ideas about uh, linked data and, and metadata within this system as well. So um, just wanted to start off by, by acknowledging that uh, I'm here on, on UVic campus in Victoria, BC, Canada right now. And uh, this is the unceded territory of the Lekwungen and the Saanich people. And these are all taken during the winter. And so uh, it's also a nice way to kind of rub it into the rest of the world of how beautiful it is here all the time. Um, all right, so uh, let's uh, let's talk about uh, UVic Digital Collections. So um, we do use Vault Samvira, uh, and at UVic we have, you know, probably small to mid-sized digital collections, I would say, around 40,000 digital objects in over 60 discrete collections. And uh, we decided that we are going to move a few years ago from Content DM, which was our previous platform, a uh, vendor platform, uh, and we are going to move to Vault, uh, which is our kind of a local branding for uh, Samvira used to be called Hydra. Um, so, uh, so we decided a few years ago that we were going to make this conversion and, and migrate a lot of our content over. Uh, why did we choose Samvira? Well, I think, you know, for us, native linked data support was a, was a big part of it and, and its use of Fedora 4. Um, it also offers for us a, a little bit more of a flexible uh, model of digital asset management. So uh, what happens with a lot of these digital objects is that they do kind of, uh, we want to nest them within different collections. Usually that usually comes up without having to duplicate those objects in all these different collections. You can do collections and sub collections. It's this kind of Portland core uh, data model idea that you should be able, to be able to kind of like envision this digital object in a bunch of different scenarios. Um, uh, it also had something called Haiku, which is kind of a Samvira in a box, so it offered a little bit of an easier path to deployment in terms of open source software for us, uh, which ended up being plenty challenging anyway, but uh, anyway, uh, that, uh, that was kind of uh, appealing to us as we started out. 
so at the moment, we are currently migrating. Uh, it's a few years later, and um, and we're still migrating. And it's mostly because uh, we're trying to really transform a lot of our data. Um, and the way uh, that our digital collections metadata was in ContaDM was kind of grown like topsy, like since like 2005, you know, everyone wanted a digital library and then we started putting content in. It wasn't really well kind of coordinated and organized across the entire system. So now is our chance. Um, within Sambira, we have a unified data model and application profile. Uh, so now we're doing a lot of cleaning of that data to correspond to what the what the Sambira data model is and application profile. And we're also along the way converting a lot of these textual values, analyzing them and converting them to URIs whenever possible. So why do we actually want to kind of, you know, uh, some, a few thoughts, I guess, uh, about metadata and linked data in Vault. Um, uh, you know, some of it is to connect our data to the world. So, so our application profile means that we're applying a lot of URIs from existing schema and vocabularies from elsewhere. We're not just kind of creating it from scratch. And we'll kind of see that in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, we, uh, like I said, we are creating, a, we have created a kind of a a linked uh, data application profile that is like a, an application profile that uses linked data or specifies what the linked data should look like, as opposed to, you know, the huge variance that we saw with a lot of our digital collection metadata before that. And, you know, some principles that we're trying to trying to employ in this system um, are machine readability. So that's where linked data and URIs come in. Uh, robust simplicity that is, you know, getting away from these ideas of these huge long text strings that yes, they do have semantic meaning, but meaning, but I think a lot of our patrons no longer kind of search that way. So trying to think about getting those values right and solid completely within a system so that they're reliable, um, as opposed to trying to like uh, handcraft a lot of these, these big long strings. Um, faceted search is something that we, we want to use. And so we're using OCLC fast quite a bit in our, in our digital collections. And also the idea that's kind of a, a part of uh, part of linked data too is divorcing data from display. So assigning those URIs on the back end and then displaying the labels associated with those URIs. Uh, here's a look at our human readable uh, application profile. And so we see again, you know, those property URIs we're able to pull in from schema and prov and uh, European a data model and uh, WCore. core. And then for the vocabulary itself, we're also bringing in various vocabularies from Art and architecture thesaurus in this case, and fast and write statements and those kinds of things. Uh, here is a uh, a work within uh, Vault, and uh, I just love, this is not about IIIF, but I just love the IIIF viewer. And you can zoom in and get really detailed with all of these digital objects. It's just so beautiful. Uh, and so this is what the metadata looks like for for that object. And so all of these are URIs on the back end, and then labels that have been generated uh, within. Sambira. And those are the labels that the user sees. They never have to see the URIs if they don't want to. We don't want to inflict that on any of our users. Um, and also, these are the values that get, get indexed, of course, for search and show up in the facets, too. And again, these are coming, up, coming from all kinds of different vocabularies. Uh, this is what it looks like on the back end as we add metadata uh, within Sanvira. So if we looked at, if we wanted to add a subject to that work, uh, we would have first be faced with a choice. Uh, so we would add a URI. Um, so whenever possible, that's kind of our instruction is let's try to add a URI. So in this case, it would be a URI coming from OCLC fast. Uh, so we would click on that. And then in the kind of the lower kind of panel here, we see what that looks like. You would start typing it. Uh, you would do a lookup to the fast vocabulary as you start typing. And then you'd select one of these values. And then what's actually being applied there is the URI. But it's all happening in the back. So um, you know we, we kind of inflict so much uh, terror on a lot of our uh, metadata uh, people around having to deal directly with URIs and linked data. So this is a really good system for applying the URI without actually having to deal with it um, and uh, kind of type it out or anything. Um, so, so that's the way you do it. Do it. Uh, there's also the option for a text field. And uh, that's really important, I think, in digital collections. There's so much primary material uh, that we deal with. There's documents. Um, and a lot of these entities that we're dealing with here are not available in any of the existing linked data vocabularies. Um, we're kind of looking at you know, possibilities around minting our own URIs for a lot of these entities. And then even then, it's a question of, you know, a lot of these cases for digital collections, it's um, uh, it's kind of inappropriate to like hold, you know, entity information about a lot of these entities too. So, um, so we definitely need to have that other kind of possibility around adding text fields. Um, I would say too, around some of our faculty projects, which we house uh, within within Vault too, um, they often 
they have good vocabulary. It's just that we can't apply a URI to those things. And so for a lot of that material too, we want to keep what they've created um, as you know, things like subjects. Um, so anyway, that's what it looks like. Um, in terms of uh, kind of, uh, you could just go to the browser and put another uh, extension onto that. And then you can see kind of the back link data and what that looks like. And so we see kind of our, our typical link data structure. We've got our subject uh, and our predicate and our object in this case, and they're all URI. So we're kind of reaching for that five-star link data that Jim Berners Lee talked about. Why link data? Why do I like it? I don't know. And we get a lot of criticism, you know, like it's it's a lot of work to get to a textual value that people are just searching for. Um, and, and that's really kind of what we're doing. So these are, this is a little bit of an apology, although I'm not here to uh, defend it too much, but uh, a little bit of an apology. Um, uh, I like creating that little bit of data, that URI. Uh, to me, it contains multitudes. Uh, you can pull in various labels uh, based on different languages uh, for the, attached to that URI. Uh, I would say the next one is a really big one for me, which is, uh, gives us an exit strategy and flexibility going forward for our metadata. So if we decide that we want to move away from OCLC fast for some of these vocabularies, uh, we can we have that URI that can help us connect to other kind of equivalent identifiers. And you can go like three or four kind of identifiers away. If we want to move to ISNI, then that's probably an LC record. And so it gives us a lot more flexibility moving forward. And uh, yeah, so it's really good. Um, and uh, why link data again? Here I am defending it again. Um, why link data? Well, I think, you know, uh, for us, I think increasingly we want our data to talk to each other really intelligently and precisely in our unified discovery. And so the idea in our digital collections in Sambira is that we do want to have that as linked data. That's pretty easy to do uh, within Sambira because it's built kind of as a linked data system. Uh, we've sprinkled a lot of linked data in our catalog records. We're not really using it, but again, we're kind of like preparing for. Uh, the notion that we will be able to use linked data across all of our different systems and our archival system as well. Um, uh, we can't use linked data there yet either, but we've, we've started to populate some values within Wikidata and we are including those just in the records, just you know, anticipating that we'll be able to use linked data there too. So uh, we also, of course, want to talk to like things that uh, Susan was talking about, uh, faculty projects and really this really rich, deep uh, source of uh, data and knowledge around a lot of things that we have in our collection. So how do we connect to those things? And we think that linked data is also going to facilitate that. Um, just a couple of thoughts on linked data, open data and open source. So it gives us a lot of agency, cho choice, and flexibility. We could, we, I created that application profile kind of from scratch based on an analysis of the metadata we had created so far. So we could decide what properties and vocabularies we want to use. Uh, if I want other functionality added to that application, uh, I could just ask our developers and they will tell me to take a hike or they'll say, yes, good, good idea. And uh, yeah, let's, let's try to bring that into that um, into our application. The cost, I mean, I don't know, maybe this has come up a lot, maybe, uh, maybe it hasn't, but it's just so much heavy lifting, like it's a lot. Um, and hiring developers, and I do wanna name our two developers, Brayden Justice, who kind of set the system up for us and now works elsewhere, and uh, Tiffany Chan, who's now our senior developer. Uh, but they've, they've done a lot of work around getting this just to a stable place. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, development for the size of, of somebody like, uh, uh, of an institution the size of, of a place like uh, UBIC, um, you know, keeping those developers, hiring them, uh, that's all uh, very much an issue. So anyway, thanks, that's me. Great, thank you so much, Dean. Um, next is Philip Skur, and he's Associate University Librarian for Technical and Access Services at Stanford University. Great, thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Great. Um, go back. So uh, let me start out by saying, so what is linked data for production or LD for P and how does it fit into the open source community? And how is it that we'd like to use LD for P to link to the world's data in a free and open way? So it all started in 2011 when the Stanford University Libraries and the Council on Libraries and Information Resources held a week-long conference on the prospects for a large-scale 
multinational, multi-institutional prototype for a linked data environment focused on libraries and the resources of most need to them. From the very beginning, our interest was in this open global ecosystem. Although the knowledge a university creates <clears throat> advances our understanding of the world, it's only a part of a global web of knowledge and derives its ultimate importance from its place in that open web. One of the great outcomes of this first conference was a concise summary of the benefits of linked data. First, the linked data approach offers significant advantages over current practices for creating and delivering library data while providing a natural extension to the collaborative sharing models historically employed by libraries. And second, linked data, and especially linked open data, is shareable, extensible, and easily reusable. It supports multilingual functionality for data and user services, such as the labeling of concepts identified by language agnostic URIs. And so with all that as a background, our adventure began. LD4P has three stages so far. The first was simply called linked data for production and lasted from 2016 to 2018. Now this first phase was focused on assessing the tools and architecture we would need to move into a true production system. The second phase was called pathway to implementation and went from 2018 to 2020. The second phase focused on the completion of minimally viable products for the tools we were developing and clearing the pathway to production. It also allowed us to expand the project to a cohort of libraries from the program for cooperative cataloging. And the current phase is called closing the loop and is going from 2020 to 2022. Its focus is on the life cycle of library data from acquisitions all the way through to discovery to ensure that all aspects are supported in a cohesive environment. Now, all the grants have focused on the transition of basic technical services workflows from their current infrastructure built on MARC to linked open data and the web. Now, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with MARC or machine readable cataloging, but it's very hard to believe that MARC is an artifact of the 1960s. What other cutting edge industry that you know is still running on a technology that is over 50 years old? Developed by Henriette Avram at the Library of Congress, Mark allowed us to move our bibliographic data from catalog cards to machine readable form. Now there was tremendous advantages in the communication and sharing of our data electronically. It allowed metadata created for a particular resource in one location to be shared and reused by another anywhere in the world. But these flat files of data that link through character strings are semantically inarticulate. Although machines can link some of the data that is there, they don't know what that data actually means. Our goal then was to transform a library's data and infrastructure into something that was both semantically articulate, but could also link to all the other freely open data appearing on the web. LD4P has grown tremendously over the past few years and has had many partners, both national and international. But for today's talk, I'd like to focus on the open aspects of LD4P. First, there's the tools and technology. Uh, the first is Synopia, the linked data editor, something called questioning authority, and then uh, aspects of discovery. And the second is community, and that mostly focuses on a group called LD4. The most critical development was the creation of an environment that allowed catalogers to catalog directly as linked data. And it was essential to us that this tool would be available via the cloud, as many libraries don't have the technical staff to set up the environment locally. That editor is now ready for use and is available to anybody worldwide to use for experimentation at synopia.io. We made the conscious decision to, you, to make sure that Synopia was as broadly useful as possible so that developers made sure that it was not dependent on any particular ontology in order to function. Whether you want to create data as schema.org for Google or in the Europeana data map format for Europeana or as BibFrame for a traditional library, Synopia can support you. However, we also realized that libraries were committed to an ontology called BibFrame, and so BibFrame compatibility is still the focus of many of Synopia's features. 
By August 2020, Sanopia had over 400 users from over 120 organizations worldwide and nearly 3,000 linked data descriptions for library resources. Registrations are still growing, and there is a developing global community using Sanopia as its open linked data editor. Questioning Authority is an open source tool designed for searching and bringing in entities into the Sanopia cataloging environment. The development here is being done by teams at Cornell and the School of Library and Information Science at the University of Iowa. Data from various open sources are standardized and cached so that the cataloger can query, explore, and import data into Sanopia in a standardized way. Currently, the team is focused on implementing a new indexing scheme for querying the cache using Sparkle queries to create a blob of triples that are stored in the index. This has led to significant performance and accuracy test improvements and is already in production. They are also adding new information resources to the cache. The most exciting development here has been conversations with OCLC about a direct connection to their new entity backbone. A final and very significant area is to influence data providers directly to standardize approaches to data structure and dissemination in the entire authority food chain from consumers to producers to tool developers. The third significant area in tools and technology is discovery. And I have to thank Huda Khan at Cornell University for these slides. The discovery team is focused on the use of linked data to enhance discovery in open source tools such as Blacklight. For the incorporation of linked data into library catalogs, Cornell has worked on including Discogs information, for instance, and links uh, in the catalog display as part of their live production catalog. In addition to the work on the production catalog, the group has been exploring the use of author and subject pages which bring together information from library and external linked data sources to provide information about authors and subjects while providing context, related entities, and links back to library resources. And the final goal of linked data for production is the creation of an open community we simply call LD4. The vision for LD4 is quite simple. The world enriched with library data libraries enriched with the world's data. The homepage for this new community can be found at ld4.io and there are instructions there on how to join. You may have seen the call for proposals for our upcoming conference this July with the theme of building connections together. Besides the conference, LD4 currently supports a number of linked data affinity groups in areas such as discovery, ethics, non-Latin scripts, rare materials, serials, and uh, the most popular is Wikidata. By working with the open community to incorporate our tools and technology into global concerns of linked data and libraries, we hope to finally close that loop for libraries in that true production sense. And with that, those are my comments for today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we now have about um, 15 minutes for questions. Um, and uh, I think there was one question in the chat, uh, in the Q&A. Um, and um, can you read and answer it, uh, Dean, since it was directed to you? Or just uh, explain in your own words. <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, this is from uh, Jesse. And uh, he's talking about uh, kind of our use of FAST within OCLC FAST within um, uh, Sambira. Uh, and uh, he asks whether it's the only subject vocabulary and uh, whether it makes sense to our cataloger folks. And I would say, yes, uh, it is our only subject vocabulary at the moment um, in our deployment. And it's uh, we're using that same kind of questioning authority um, uh, gem, I guess, with Sam Vera to kind of look up a lot of these entity values. Uh, so uh, we are kind of looking up exclusively in FAST. And then if we want other kind of subject terminology added at this point, they would just be textual values. But we're really kind of like moving things towards FAST. And of course, it duplicates so much of the terminology that's in Library of Congress. Um, so uh, our cataloger folks, uh, they like it. Uh, and also, uh, 
the interface is really easy to use and fast, I find. And so uh, even for like short term projects, which is a lot of, you know, the case in a lot of times with digital projects, uh, people will kind of um, be just working on a project for a few months, we don't have time to do full subject analysis, or subject training and how to do LCSH. And so, um, uh, so fast is a nice kind of easy entry point into kind of a stable uh, vocabulary that has a lot in common with LCSH. So uh, yeah. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions? Uh, you can type in the chat or the Q&A. Um, I have a question for Philip. Um, I'm not um, very familiar with the linked open, or, sorry, with the library world, um, nor with OLF. So I don't know if this makes sense. But um, um, are you working with any other um, open source platforms than Blacklight? Um, so I'm just trying to think. So Blacklight, I think uh, we're. I think a lot of it should be portable, be portable over to Viewfind as well. Um, I think um, we have worked with a lot of other communities, but a lot of them aren't necessarily open. So for instance, um, we've done a lot of work uh, with the Library of Congress. We have worked with a um, product from Casolini Libri called, um, uh, oh, suddenly it just went right out of my mind. Um, um, the share virtual discovery environment. So for instance, um, there is uh, the data from the program for cooperative cataloging, past, present, and future has all been converted to linked open data using the open bid frame ontology. Um, and it is made available to the world freely and openly um, at that platform that uh, Costellini is providing. So although uh, the data um, you can join it as a actual member. The data has been converted and is freely available to anybody in the world. Um, we also have um, starting the connections with OCLC um, and we have tried to make connections as well to various uh, library service platforms. So we hope to be able to reach out to those that use MARC. Um, so for instance, Alma or Circe Dynex. <clears throat> and then also we are hope hopefully uh, make a connection between the editor itself and Folio as well, um, so that we could catalog, uh, people could cut directly in RDF and have a connection to the inventory. Um, so we haven't, we're not quite ready to propose that yet, but it's something that we are very interested in doing. Thank you so much. Um, Susan, I, I was wondering if, um, oh, there is a question. Dean and others, do you interlink with IIIF resources and vice versa in order to enhance tri the IIIF resources with LOD as machine readable metadata? Um, we don't at the moment. I would say, you know, we've been really focused on getting uh, getting everything stable. Uh, and so that's been our main concern so far. Uh, but we don't do that. But of course, that's another part of this is, yeah, that those linkages between that triple IF makes possible as well. So uh, yeah, so I'd say uh, we haven't yet, but but definitely it's something we'd like to do. There is also a comment. Oh, did anybody else want to answer? I'm sorry. Oh, Susan, you're muted. Um, I'll just say that uh, from a scholarly perspective, the ability to link directly to visual and um, other resources through IIIF is, is one of the most exciting things I think that's been enabled so far uh, with linked open data because the dissemination tools are so good for it. Uh, so I think it's a very inspiring, um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely, links data will definitely be, be using IIIF uh, for sure as part of its. Um, I would just add for LD for P for not, oh, I'm sorry. Um, LD4P is not, um, it, it really was geared towards sort of traditional library cataloging. So in that sense, it hasn't focused on IIIF, but uh, the editor is just a generic open source RDF editor, uh, and it could be used with anything. So there'd be nothing prevent you from working with IIIF. That's great. Um, here's another great question. One of the problems with um, Library of Congress subject headings is that they are very Eurocentric. Was there an effort to decolonize the vocabulary when using new subject headings? Um, I 
can talk about that. And I would say uh, not yet. Uh, we're not as an institution ready for that. Uh, so currently we're kind of uh, starting that process of uh, changing all of our cataloging data uh, to more appropriate subject headings. Uh, so that would carry over into our digital systems and as well. Um, so um, yeah, so I would say not yet, although well, I mean, we've been discussing it for years. Uh, it's a real issue. Uh, Library of Congress subject headings are not really appropriate uh, language and vocabulary to use. So we're just trying to figure out what our strategy is. I think, you know, one of the, uh, one of the challenges is, uh, I think everyone recognizes that the existing vocabulary is unacceptable, um, but it's really just what that target should look like and the process you get to to actually understand what those target values should be. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I don't think that's available as a linked data standard. Not that it has to be, but um, but yeah. So short answer, no. <laughs> yeah. There's a, a question addressed to everybody that's um, a good one and um, a, a comment about Vault just quickly that um, Dean described and Phil mentioned being um, uh, the, uh, the LD4P um, working with Vault open source code re, uh, reuse in action. Um, so might you each discuss what you think LOD does in your project that really breaks the non the traditional non LOD metadata data schemas and how we associate our understanding of cultural artifacts, not technically but culturally um, and psychologically. Well, I'll dive in there because it kind of uh, um, segues from the last question as well around decolonizing metadata. I do think there's, you know, it's just a fact that the library world's so big, there's so many records, it's so technologically complicated to migrate things um, and to move away from vocabularies and to get the sort of consensus that's required to um, institute new vocabularies that there's this huge lag, right? Those Library of Congress subject headings date back to the late 19th century, the heyday of imperialism. So of course, there, you know, there's bias everywhere, but there's a ton of bias, obviously, in in a, a, a fixed vocabulary that's that old. So I think one of the beauties of linked open data is that it's not an either or. You can you can still have library records or archival records that reference those vocabularies because that is what is feasible for that institution at the time. But if you can combine it with um, scholarly representations that are using newer and perhaps less stable and perhaps less authoritative vocabularies, you're introducing um, the, the important sort of discursive differences into the representation of that object digitally that, that, that makes it relevant and, and brings it alive and brings it into the sort of contemporary uh, context. So I, I think the ability for linked data to support contradiction and difference and to represent diversity much more fully than us any any single uh, vocabulary can and that isn't fixed uh, deliberately um, it, it really offers um, a very different kind of um, metadata broadly speaking representation or metadata plus representation of of an object um, that could really shift how people interact with with digital records. I think the one thing that I would add, it, what I think is really interesting is that to me, this is really an issue of discovery. Um, we have just been talking about this, uh, uh, this issue recently at Stanford. So it's interesting in that certainly using linked open data, you can include um, you can include subject terminology from any thesaurus and, it, and it's great to be able to get a number of different perspectives within your catalog uh, within your discovery system um, but what we we're finding is that sort of traditional discovery systems really have that card catalog left in mind so that subjects appear at the end of the display and they're all sort of jumbled together so it becomes sort of a hodgepodge of of terms some terms might be the same but they come from different thesauri and they actually mean different things so to me one of the big issues here is not necessarily the inclusion of other thesauri which is super it is sort of in discovery, making sense of multiple thesauri in a single display to users or allowing them to choose which thesaurus that they want to actually see. So it's interesting that some of these, the issues about linked open data and discovery and how you make it all work together is all really tied together. I'm afraid we are just about out of time. I'm so sorry, Dean, you didn't get to answer that as well. Um, so um, yes. We uh, are out of time. Thank you all very much.
Yes, thank you all very, very much for um, a great session. And thank you to all the attendees and those that ask questions. Our next session uh, starts on the hour and we look forward to seeing you all um, for the CDL and resource sharing session. So thank you again to our panelists very much. Bye, thanks Everyone. for organizing and thanks to Laura for inviting us to do this, it was great.